so I guess we can get started. So welcome everyone to this fireside chat with uh, John Di Liu, the founder of Ecosystem Restoration Camps, and Piero Franco, all the way from Matera in the south of Italy, camp manager of Camp Roccia Viva. John, would you like to start with a message or with uh, some music? No, I don't think the music is, people said they couldn't hear it, so I'm gonna avoid playing any, spare you that. So you won't throw shoes at the screen or something. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to see you. And I actually have a fire today. Um, that's uh, different. It's a real one, not a virtual one. So that's also nice. I'm coming to you from Kansas. This is the home of my sister and brother-in-law and my mother. My mother is staying with my sister and brother-in-law, she's 103. <laughs> and we have just survived COVID. So I came for the holidays and, and uh, when I got here, they were, they were positive and I became positive as well. And we all survived, so that's nice. Um, I think, uh, the most important thing to realize is that we need to be um, grateful for everything and we need to be in love with the earth and we need to be kind to one another and work together and it's so great to see what's happening with the camps movement i'm getting ready as long as i stay healthy i'm going uh, on thursday to kentucky to the appalachian renewal and meet Clifford Smith, who's been developing that for the first time in person, although I've been talking with him for several years now. And um, throughout the COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic, and uh, interestingly, um, I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, and this is just a, a, a little ways away from, uh, from lovely Kentucky where the Appalachian Renewal Camp is. And he has 7,000 acres. And it's about, the, the work of the camp is about um, mountaintop removal. But it's also about the society and the, the community around there, which has been, which has been kind of depressed and, and uh, in extreme poverty. And, and uh, they have quite a lot of problems. So it's going to be exciting to think about this and the ideas which I've spread uh, for a while about central kitchens, creator spaces, and and cultural stages are all coming coming together in many camps. So Appalachian Renewal is one of the camps which is working on central kitchens and creator spaces and and cultural stages, and I think that's really important to keep up the spirits. So it's gonna be hard for us. There, there are several issues that we need to think about. One is that in many parts of the world right now, there's going to be famine. Uh, I was talking with the, um, with the World Food Program and their projections because of the war in Ukraine and with Russia has disrupted some of the industrialized um, food crops that mainly go to the Middle East and Africa and some other, other countries. And so there's gonna be quite a lot of famine. And in the past, in the 80s, what was done, if you remember the food aid concerts and things where everybody was very worried about Ethiopia and other places, this started a movement to feed the people with this industrialized food. And from the United States, the United States sent genetically modified soy cornmeal. And this is not a very good food. I mean, it's not a food that I would want to eat really. And also this is not allowed to even be sold for animal feed in many parts of the world, for instance, the European Union. And um, so after many years of that, 
in the early 20s, I was sent to Africa to share the lessons of the Lewis Plateau with the Africans. And what happened was that uh, somebody else's got not muted. Yeah. Um, but uh, what happened was that the analysis there at that time was that having had um, food aid for 20 years had massively disrupted the agricultural systems in Ethiopia and destroyed the agricultural markets because free food is always less expensive than food that you buy in the market. So there was no market for locally grown food and there was no incentive to grow food. And uh, at, at that uh, at that point, um, it could be me. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, the uh, at that point, the um, the problem was that uh, all uh, millions of pe people were hungry, and they had been fed for 20 years, and the international community was spending about 380 million years. Uh, a dollars per year on food aid, but it wasn't doing, it wasn't changing anything. So they, they transitioned to something called the Sustainable Land Management Program and took the food aid money and paid the people to do restoration. Now, this was over 15 years ago, and there's quite a bit of data now on what happened in Ethiopia. Now, it has not worked well lately because of the, um, I think in a sense, it was successful because it made the land more valuable. And then the ethnic groups began to fight over the land. But um, what we, we need to see is that people by themselves can restore very large areas. And so while we're studying and working in small places, we really need to broaden our perspective and understand that the, the real task is to restore the earth and, and that everyone has a role to play. So it's nice if we get our communities and our, our families as resilient as possible, but really the task right now for hu human civilization is that we do this on a planetary scale. And I think it's also very, very interesting what we're gonna hear today because what we're talking about also is the, the impacts from very lo long historical time. And so this is what you're going to learn about today is that the places which have been degraded for a very long time can be restored. And it's a restoration not only of the landscape, but it's a restoration of the human spirit. It brings us together to make us happy what uh, makes us, our, our efforts now serve our children and future generations. And it's, it's what gives us satisfaction and lets us live in joy, even though it looks like if you read the news or listen to the news, that everything is falling apart. But when you, when you go out and look at the, at the nature and the earth, you realize that there's really nothing wrong with the earth. <laughs> the problem is human beings and human civilization. So we just need to do a better job. And that's really all I had to say today. I hope it's uh, useful for you and that uh, we can have a great talk. And um, I'm, you know, 70 years old, sitting in a nice warm place. So after the, uh, after the fireside chat, we can just keep it going with a little fireside conversation afterwards, if anybody wants to. So thank you so much. Back to you, Christina. Thank you, John. That was such a great introduction to Camp Archaviva. And before I will leave the floor to Piero, let's um, just share some news from the movement. So I will share my screen. Here we go. So, B 
before moving forward, just a reminder about our household rules. Um, it would be great if you can hold your questions until after Pierre's presentation. You can either put them in the chat if you're a bit shy or if you're in a very loud and crowded space. <laughs> um, or we're very happy to hear from you and hear your voice so you can ask your questions in person by raising uh, your hand through the zoom settings and then um yeah the discussion will last about one hour um but you're as john also just said you're welcome to stay for other questions and the longer discussion so here are some events from the camps next camp experiences and courses um, the first one is in uh, uh, California, where Camp Fire Restoration Project is organizing several different events. We have uh, one workshop on the 14th of January and two webinars, uh, one on post fire watershed restoration and resilience on the 16th and the other one on green building. So we will all learn how to build buildings with cobs, straw bales and other natural material. And this one is happening on the 10th of March. Another camp in California, the Bird House, is also organizing uh, a workshop on the 14th of January on Art and Ecology, uh, uh, Art and Ecology Day. Moving forward, we will go all the way to Ireland now, where Camp Chaltakri will be running a course on how to develop a local food hub with the support of uh, the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And it's going to be very exciting. Yeah, because I'm on, okay. So when you're ready, you're welcome to carry on. There will be leaders such as Vandana Shiva and John De Liu joining. And then we will go to Spain, another European camp, Camp Altiplano, and is planning a tree planting event and an open day at La Junquera Farm on the 18th of March. And plus, there is an ongoing opportunity to volunteer to plant trees until May this year in Altiplano. And you can check our website for further details about all these experiences, not only Altiplano. And Embercombe in England invited to their introduction to rewilding experience, running from the 21st till the 23rd of March. And finally, last but not least, Green Pop in South Africa, that is getting ready to organize the next Reforest Fest, which is a, an amazing, an amazing event with dance and, and lots of fun and music and of course, thousands, thousands of trees to be planted. It will take place uh, very close to Cape Town in South Africa, just two hours and a half drive between the 7th and the 10th of April. Moving forward to the camp news, uh, again, Altiplano, they're getting ready to host six volunteers, which is not great news because Altiplano has been hosting volunteers for a long time, but this time the difference is that they are doing so through the European Solidarity Corps program, which means that the volunteers will be completely funded by the European Union. And also the camp will have some expenses covered. And this is a great opportunity. They will have uh, uh, people working almost full time on the site and it will hopefully really impact the, the landscape. So congratulations to Altiplano for making this happen. And then King's Garden in the Netherlands that planted 86 trees last Saturday to create a habitat for tree warblers. And then a new camp joining the movement, the Corcovado Foundation, a great initiative from Costa Rica, which also adds a new country to our map. Costa Rica is a new country and yeah, it's a great project. So we're very excited about this cooperation. And all the way now to Kenya, where Koromi River that has been planted, planting trees in this autumn, managed to plant 14,000 trees in just two days with the help of the local community and volunteers. And also their planting efforts are still uh, going on because there has been some unexpected rain. So this is also very good news. Um, and finally, um, just a few impact numbers from 2022, from the full movement. Um, in 2022, 
we have been working to restore over 3 million hectares globally. Nearly 3 million trees have been planted at our ecosystem restoration camps. And the ERC has provided a transformative experience to more than 21,000 individuals. Which brings me to our next slide, that is, join the movement, keep supporting us, and invite your colleagues, your friends, anybody who might have an interest and perhaps hasn't heard from us yet, or maybe could, could be interested in joining to, to join as a supporter. And thank you to all of you who are already supporting us. So, so now I would leave the floor to Piero. Are you ready, Piero? Yes. <laughs> Great. Let's move then to the first slide. As I said at the beginning, today we have Piero all the way from Southern Italy, Basilicata region, Matera specifically, and he will talk about Rocha Viva. Camper Hello everyone. First of all, I want to thank uh, John for this opportunity and also for his message, initial message. And then Jan Heng that he's, he's been <laughs> following my presentations for ages, so I think. <laughs> but you will know it by heart. <laughs> but I'm happy that you are here. Yeah. Then I want to thank all of you uh, for the work we are doing. I think we are connected, even though I maybe I will probably never meet all of you, but I think we are connected deeply in the work we are doing. So thanks everyone. As a human, I say thank you. <laughs> and then, yeah, Christine, of course, that she came here last week, I think. And uh, it was really nice to meet her in person. And, I want to thank you, apart from our work, especially for the, for the hope that we all carry. And then uh, I think it's the most important thing. We don't know how things will, will go, but the, the, the thing that we keep, the, that this hope, I think it's uh, really, really incredible. And while Christina was here, uh, maybe three, four times a day, I would ask her, like, Christina, are you ready to do what? To save the world. <laughs> so I think I feel, the, I feel that I want to do all I can. And uh, I'm really working hard, I think. And so I'm really happy to introduce you to our camp. I'm the camp manager, and I created the... It's an ONG, it's called Rocha Viva. It was created um, seven years ago, uh, in theory, but practically we've been working for the last uh, five years. We're being active on the territory. And I chose this photo because it's uh, after a day work, planting trees, um, and then we all sit down and share what we what we felt during the day that's me in the photo sitting there <laughs> and then yeah you can keep on with the next slide i think we have a short video i want to show you it's in italian but with english subtitles i hope you can i hope you enjoy it and thanks christina for your help <laughs> with the sharing <laughs> Insieme a questa comunità, insieme a questa comunità, solo mai sarai se al bosco di unirai, al fuoco domani il cambiamento della foresta scorsa il canto. Il cambiamento è nazione, roccia viva la connessione! Il cambiamento è nazione. Siamo l'associazione Roccia Viva, come potete vedere siamo sul terreno il nostro progetto con tutti gli alberelli che sono stati piantati e stiamo terminando di piantare. Abbiamo piantato un'area di tre, e abbiamo preso l'acqua 
Siamo in pompa a pannelli solari che prende l'acqua da un pozzo e scende con un tubo madre fino alla cisterna che raccoglie l'acqua e come vedete tanti piccoli tubi eh, come abbiamo piantato gli alberi per linee, linee di accumulazione e di abbondanza. Le linee di abbondanza sono gli alberi che cresceranno più grandi insieme agli alberi medi, agli alberi piccoli e agli arbusti. Le linee di accumulazione invece saranno le linee che cresceranno molto in fretta e noi poteremo durante gli anni e daremo da mangiare agli, a tutti gli altri anni. Le specie di piante sono endemiche, abbiamo corbezzolo, filirea, albero di giuda, bagolaro e tanti altri. Oggi è una bellissima giornata, siamo qui a piantare alberi, c'è un sole meraviglioso, non vorremmo essere al sole. Siamo tanti volontari di Doccia Viva e stiamo costruendo una foresta e questo ci rende veramente felici. Venite con noi! Die zit daar al, uh, het hier begon ook over Spanje. Ja, het, uh, okay. hij is nu nog wel meer netten. Dat is onze video. En het is een korte ding van wat we did. Maybe uh, it was two years ago. En zoals je kunt zien van de from the images, most of our people are locals. So that's really, it was really a surprise for me when I came back because I studied abroad for 13 years. And then I chose to come back to my land and start uh, this project. And I was really surprised because after one year being here and feeling kind of lonely, kind of saying, ah, oh, in the south of Italy, a small city, maybe I will never find people who, who think like me. But actually, slowly, I could meet so many people that were traveling all over the world and they decided like me to come back. So now we are a network of 40 to 50 people working in different lands and sharing apart from uh, the work with trees and stuff, but also like the products we produce. And it's uh, like a spread community and it's really nice. And then we can host people from all over the world. You could see from the video, they, they were from Taiwan, my friend from Taiwan. So where we are, we are located in the south of Italy. You can see it uh, from this photo. And this is our region. It's drawn like that. It's called Basilicata. And it's one of the region where uh, they planted wheat historically. Uh, so since the Roman times, they've been uh, cutting trees. And basically now the landscape is only fields, fields of wheat and uh, crops, basically, uh, with monoculture. And there are no trees at all, almost. And the trees that are present on the territory, they are all planted, they've been, plant, they've been planted uh, in the 60s. So it's mostly pines and uh, eucalyptus because they wanted to do this fast reforestation. Uh, unfortunately, the situation is really <laughs> like a disaster because the soil erosion is really, really high. And uh, you can go on with a slide. Mm. So why did I put the, the, the region, the entire region? Because actually the, the lands we are working on, they are spread all over that region and even the Apulia region, which is the close region. Uh, we are not only in Matera, but we, we have different, different lands all over the places. And we're trying to connect all these lands and create a, a unified project. 
So this is the landscape <laughs> in, our, in our region. And you can see there are few like uh, lentisco, I don't know the, the English word, this, this kind of shrubs. And they, it's the Mediterranean shrubs. They, they manage to, to grow. But you can see these white areas, it's like a desert, basically. We call them Kalanki, and it's basically sand. So all the clay part of the soil, uh, it went to, down to, to, to Bali, and it's the only place where we, can, where we could plant like oaks, but uh, maybe in 10 years time, because now it's, uh, most of the work is to rebuild like the soil structure. So we keep on planting the shrubs and the Mediterranean bushes, basically. So we have a lot of, uh, a long period of aridity, most mainly it's like from May to October with no rain, maybe one day or two day rains. And uh, all the problems that uh, go with this. So we have uh, high soil erosion because of uh, over exploitment and the biodiversity loss is huge. Um, of course, the water is scarce and it's polluted because all the, the farmers are using a lot of chemicals and it's difficult to, because most of them it's an old population. Young people, they, they all left, apart from us, <laughs> they were here. <laughs> but we, um, so it's difficult also culturally and socially to, to make a change. But it's, um, I, want it to, I want to see it um, positively and potentially, uh, because really the potential is huge here. Um, because we talk about big owners of lands and most of them, they have no, mm, no young people to give the lands to. So most, they maybe donate them to the church. And uh, so it's a really high potential of spreading um, uh, into like uh, ecosystem restoration. Christina, can you go on, please? <laughs> yeah, so what is our, our mission? Is to cultivate well being, um, like, and social and environmental regeneration. I, I chose these photos because uh, this was an Erasmus Plus program and we had like 20 uh, people from the States helping us planting trees. And um, so it's nice that we can uh, start to collaborate even internationally, thanks to the contacts I have also because I was living 13 years abroad. So, and it's, it's getting bigger and bigger with this, uh, like hospitality, we, we, we like to have people here. We try to find places to host them. And it's nice when we work all together. And so the thing that I was also telling John last time we met is that the, uh, the beautiful thing about our project is really the networking with local people. So we have collaborations with all the, a lot of ONGs um, NGOs, sorry, in uh, in Matera, but also in the on the Italian territory, and uh, a lot of young people wanted wanted the change. So uh, we are really trying. I think most more than uh, planting trees and restoring ecosystem, we are also we are focusing on this. We are focusing on creating um, contacts and community and to to become big in that sense. So if we collaborate, then really we can, for example, looking for new lands and it doesn't come from one individual or one organization, but it's like uh, a lot of contact. Uh, can you please go on? Um, so yeah, the main activities are based on uh, networking on the territory, reforestation of degraded areas. Um, expanding ecosystem restoration, so also the managing of water, um, soil enrichment, I will show you later uh, what we're doing in detail. Uh, spreading permacultural values, so we host a lot of experts of uh, Permaculture Institute in Italy, for example, Sabiana Parodi or Mark Mer, 
uh, even Jeff Lawton had a he had a quick visit here. Um, we work in collaboration even with uh, Ignazio Schettini, who was the one translating the Bill Mollison book in Italian. Uh, and we host courses, basically. Permaculture course, the official one, but even weekends where we go in different lands and we can do like by uh, eco building or um, uh, like uh, how to recognize wild plants, edible plants and things like this. So we have a lot of opportunities educational and cultural opportunities for the communities and for the visitors. And this is a photo of uh, one month ago when uh, 65 people came um, of, an, uh, of a business. They, donate, they donated to the NGO and they came to help us uh, planting trees. So it was an army of people and it was only me organizing everybody. It was a crazy day, but it was fun and reward i was rewarded uh, yeah so you can keep on the slides so this is the let's call it the main camp so i i would say the our experimental phase started four years ago and we started um, on this hill the the red circle here and we planted uh, around, in two years time, we planted uh, 7,000 trees only here. Uh, you can see uh, there were already shrubs of wild pear trees and other uh, shrubs, but we, we really created, it's the, the, the land you could see in the video. And uh, yeah, we we'd use different techniques to plant. One, it was with irrigation system because the, it, it's too arid to try with no water at all. But we also tried with the little swales and gills of trees around the, the, big, the big trees you can see here on the photos. Uh, so we call it like mother, mother trees and we would plant uh, around them so we could, um, uh, we could have a little bit of shade and we could have a little bit of... Um, yeah, spreading seeds also. Um, so the second uh, year, we were focusing on this circle up here. So we were planting uh, half of this land. And so this is the experimental phase. And it's, it, lasts until, it lasted until uh, last year. You can keep on. So this is in a business called Masseria La Fiorita. And I was working here as soon as I came back from my travels. I was working here for five months and then I was uh, on the owner's back for uh, basically five months that I was working there, telling him, oh, we should restore land, we should restore land, we should restore land. And then at one point he was so fed up with my words that he said, okay, Piero, take five hectares and do whatever you want. And so we started the project there. And uh, yeah, so this is a photo showing you a guild basically we would uh, dig a trench like a sway and then put the bug the all the the soil on this side and we would put a, a bio row made of uh, like prune uh, branches of trees um, on the side then we would mulch with uh, straw or we even use like uh, um, like paper it depends what we have avail availability. And then we choose four to five dish different species of trees and we put, uh, we put them in between the swale and the bio Some uh, Some of the swale, they were given water, some not. And we try to see what works better. I, I also like this part. This part of our work is the research. So every year we go to the land and we see what species they survived, uh, what kind of soil, how did it change. Uh, so it's beautiful because I, I'm a scientist uh, as a, like my for me, my background is I'm a marine biologist. So it's really nice for me to have this uh, research part. And this is the first time, um, uh, this second photo is the first time that I saw flowers on, the, on a tree that we planted. It's a uh, viburno, it's, I don't know the English word for it. Uh, I can write it down later. And it had these flowers and I, uh, I had to take a photo of it. 
so insects were coming back and all the birds as well. Uh, yeah, so you can, yeah, be born. Grazie. Thanks, Cristina. You can go on. Yeah, so this is our other photos. This is during, uh, so as I told you, we were organizing a permaculture design course. So we uh, hosted it two years ago. It was a 17 days course. Um, we were living in this uh, farm and it was, there were like 20, 20 people participating plus us. We were six, six uh, organizers and uh, three, no, we, we were four facilitators from the Permaculture Institute. And during that period that was in autumn, we could, uh, we planted uh, lots of trees. It was the beginning of our planting season. And you can see it from the picture. And this is uh, the same Viburno, the, the time we planted it. The, the one who, with the flowers later. <laughs> you can go on. So the conditions are really tough because the the soil you can see the soil it's like no covering and uh, it's really sandy in some areas and really dry. So what we do, uh, we create huge bio roll like this photo. <laughs> we transport them close to the trees to enrich the organic materials of the soil, and then we would uh, collect. We would collect lots of uh, lots of stones to make like small hills of stones that they would accumulate humidity during the during the throughout the year but especially during the dry season so at night all the humidity would concent condensate on the uh, stones and that give it to the tree the small tree if we have no opportunity to give the water and then every time we and then every time we plant trees we uh, we throw a lot of seeds, all kind of seeds. This one I have in my hand. They are like leguminosa and, and cereal crop tree, uh, crop seeds. So we would uh, host the bacteria because the the seeds from, for example, wheat they host a lot of uh, like micro microorganisms inside. Like they can host. Uh, we call them like small cells that, that that can host a lot of microorganisms. And then if you plant them together with leguminosa, uh, you can, they can fix the nitrogen and then they can start the same symbiosis with the plants and they can enrich the soil. So we would spread the, the seeds during the autumn season, then in spring, if we can, we can go back there and then uh, cut and mulch the soil. Um, yeah, you can keep on. And then sometimes we would do really huge holes and we would fill them up with a lot of stones and we call it like accumulation um, holes. And we would, for example, do a, a big hole on the, on the top side of the hill. And then we would start planting tree, guild of trees below. So all the water accumulated in, the, in that area would slowly go to the soil. And this is all the photos from the, our permaculture design course. And the nice thing is that after, after four years, three years that we did, we're still all in contact. We all communicate with these people. So it's nice. They, and they are from all over Italy. You can go on, Cristina. Yeah, so this is an example of... Uh, line of lines of trees as you can see uh, so we would do the swale then we use wool to mulch this time and uh, when we can we put a an irrigation tube what we try to do is not to buy new irrigation tubes uh, because it's plastic <laughs> but we try to ask the farmers if they have them and then we try to use them all over the years uh, it's not always possible, but we try our best. And then we use irrigation system where uh, we know that the soil is really, really sandy. So it needs water. Otherwise, all the waters go with all the nutrients to, to the valley. And we have no opportunity to, to make the tree survive. 
and yeah so this is a, another day planting all together and this is the hill i showed you on the map which is also in the video we can go on okay so after the experimental phase that we i talked about we had the phase one of the project which was this autumn so we had two uh, locations so i chose two areas one is uh, the same one masseria la fiorita but the second circle red circle i showed you on the map before and we planted one hectare and then the second location was Oquido. it's a small town uh, 45 minutes from Matera, also still in the region. And there we reforested two hectares. And the new thing that we tried this year is to plant 1,000 fruit trees in that land that we will manage all together as a community. So we will collect the fruit and then make jam, for example, or um, fermentation. Yeah, you can use it in, you know, in many ways. So it's the first time uh, Rocha Viva uh plants fruit trees and i i hope it will go well we are really happy for it i, I will show you the photos later so of the christina visited with me it's really beautiful work we did and so in total this uh, autumn sorry i didn't translate total of plants planted uh it's four thousand for this year so this is called i called it the phase phase one and then we had a uh, novelty we restored an, uh, a lake so it was already there uh, but it was empty it was so arid that it, it lost the water and it was full of shrubs so what we did we cleaned it we um, compacted more, more uh, clay on the bottom then we planted a lot of seeds and trees around it and we hoped for the best because we didn't know if the bottom of the lake would um would stay with the water so I, we didn't know if the water would be collected or would go to waste as it happened in the past and uh, it worked so you can go on maybe add some photos and christina when she came she had the luck that it was our first day to see the lake full uh, we were really happy so this is the um, what we did in Oppido, the other land I told you, it was, it's two hectares with the 1,000 fruit trees. And you can see it, it was really beautiful work. Uh, this, we have no irrigation system, but uh, we used the key line, um, the key the lines key project. project. I didn't I hear didn't it. Hear. It was a microphone problem. A question. Something is happening with the audio. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you well, Piero, now. Yeah, I can. Okay. Now I think there was another microphone open. So, uh, as you can see, we use the key lines. Basically, a key line is a swale which follows the the slope and it it it, uh, it allows the water to be collected so that uh, the water goes from a, a place where it's normally collected to a place where it's arid and it's not collected at all and uh, so you can see that there, there are maybe uh, like the land goes on we couldn't take it in the photo all of it but it's like around 30 key lines and every key land has maybe 20 species of uh, plants, not only trees, plants. So we plant like uh, shrubs, we make the covering of grass of different species. Uh, we have uh, medium sized fruit trees. We have oaks if the, the land allows it. We have all kinds of uh, species. And then we, we, we take official plants. Uh, for the insects like mellifera, like the plants that attract all the insects, um, berries. Uh, it's difficult with berries because the, you can see it's all exposed to the sun. We have no shade. But yeah, we try with the more rustic ones at the beginning and then we maybe in, during the years we can keep on adding up. And I think this is a 
I am really proud of this work we did this year. It's really, and it's also really difficult land to reach. You cannot go there by car. You have to walk. So to transport the trees, uh, the cisterns, the mulching, the straw, it, it was really tough work. And we never used machines until now. It's all volunteer. So it was huge. And I hope in five years time, we will have a, a forest there, edible forest. So it will be amazing. And you can see the lands around it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like almost desert. Yeah, you can go on. Yeah, so this is the same thing taken from another. Uh, so you can see all these key lines. And normally, uh, because this part of the land, the, the, the downhill land is richer in soil, here, this area, we planted all the, um, uh, the fruit trees, where you see like this kind of triangle. Um, yeah, you can keep on. Now you can see the area is really beautiful with all the, the small villages on the hills. And then you have some kind of, um, some kind of, woods there it's the first town that gets some trees around normally ar around matera there are no trees at all so this is the project with the lake you can see on the right side in the photo this man is our uh, it's kind of a guru for us <laughs> he's uh, he's amazing he can do all kinds of um, building eco building he knows a lot of plants uh, he observed nature for many many years He's called Jean-Claude and he helps us mostly with the permaculture design of our lands and what species to choose, how to work. He's really nice, man. And so this is the project with the lake. So you can see this area. Um, it was originally a lake, as I said, so we cleaned it up and then we put a tube uh, because when the water is too high, then it would be collected in the tube and give it to the land downhill, where we planted uh, also a fruit tree uh, garden. So, um, and then the next uh, autumn, we will start replanting the third circle. It was on the map at the beginning of the slide, which is a hill downhill the lake. So. The, the water from the lake, we will use it down there to water the trees. And uh, you can see uh, the difference between this owner's land. You can see green around and uh, uh, like far away in the photo, you can see the, the soils, the soil condition up there is, is the neighbor. And it's normally the lands we have here. So it's really a disaster. And imagine in this area, really behind the lake, you have a ancient source of water. So a spring, it comes um, from the depth of the land. And if it was for that neighbor, it would already be destroyed. But luckily the owner of this land owns it and he appreciates uh, that it's there because he gives life to his business in his farm. And uh, what we told him is like to protect the source. So we are planting a lot of trees with special roots, not uh, the, the one that goes deep. Uh, so we can protect the source because in nature, all sources must have shade. Uh, so it's the first thing that nature does. It's to cover the sources of water because uh, for a matter of magnetism, the water, when it's in the shade, it comes to the surface. It's a long uh, talk, but we can discuss it. And you should really look for the, the fourth phase of water by Pollack. It's an amazing book about water, discussing all, all this stuff. Yeah, so this is the preparation for the lake that were done in November. And then we wanted to wait for the rains to fill it up. Uh, but there were no rains. <laughs> Today, it's, it's the first day it rained after two months. So unfortunately, we couldn't have this result as we wanted, but uh, because what we did, it's not only clean up the lake, but we also dig uh, two trenches to collect water from the rain. Uh, 
and uh, unfortunately I don't have the, the photos of them because they're quite in difficult places to go um, and they're really close to the lake so they follow the slope it's like a key line and then it it would bring the water from the rains inside the lake I hope they will work in the future when it rains I hope and yeah thanks Scott uh, yeah you can go on with the photos so this is the lake <laughs> after two months we were really really happy you can see Christina in the photo <laughs> and, um, it was really nice to go there that day for me and um, so you can see the small red tube coming out of the lake how did we fill it up um, we already had um, the first time we intervened in this land, we had a um, digging uh, of a canal to bring water from the source to the farm and to the forest we planted. So we still had some tubes below the, the, the earth. Uh, so what we decided to do is to open up this canal and uh, fill up the lake with this water so it's still the water from the source which is behind the lake but we we fill this up now it's still kind of um, how do you say like stuck water but we we will soon uh, put some uh, aquatic plants so they clean up a little bit and then i think with the rains uh, because it will become higher than the tube so some of the water will go down and start like um, refilling we will i think we will dig another pond in summer down downhill so that we can use directly to the water for the next forest we want to plant and these are two of my close friends and also now they are really active with me uh, with Rocha Viva group Pasquale and uh, Serena lo sapete se per caso Someone speaking Italian. Yeah. <laughs> was that a question? You didn't tell me I was not the only one, the only Italian. <laughs> yeah, we can. Uh, the question later, right? Christine? Yes, yes. If okay. there's a question, we'll keep it for yeah. later. So you can keep on with the photos, with the slides. So, and then it comes to this uh, new uh, thing, new project we want to do. It's called Magnus Lucus. Magnus is like man, man big. Lucus is the word for uh, Latin word for uh, sacred wood. And um, so I called it Magnus Lucus because it's a project of restoration of ecosystems in the south of Italy. And you can go on with the next slide. And it's a collaboration uh, between uh, Rocha Viva, which is my NGO, Ecosystem Restoration Camps, which is us. And then plan for the planet Italy, because uh, thanks to ecosystem restoration camps, we were uh, contacted by the the manager of Plan for the Planet Italy, and they want to collaborate with us. So we are starting this project, um, collaborating the three of us. Uh, you can go for the next slide. So the idea is to uh, spreading to new lands. Um, with this, uh, with Christina, we created this map, <laughs> and um, so I already have the contact with uh, several lands around. Uh, uh, it's a total of sixty hectares that are already ready for planting. I have already the contact with the owners, and they are they agree with us. And it's uh, so the red ones are the one uh, ongoing. I didn't put them in the presentation because what I did until now is to um, take in contact <coughs> with the owners of these lands, which are my friends, and uh, giving them trees and see how they work. Uh, no problem. If you have to go, go. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks to you. And so what I did this year is I gave, I gave trees to them and uh, check if they can manage to plant them and how they care for them. So basically we have two of these red circles that we intervened and then the other four 
uh, I asked the people living there to work on them. And I didn't count the trees because I want to see the survival rate next year. But still, this creates a lot of uh, like uh, networking. So they start trusting us. Um, if it's not my friends, then their families. And, and we can build on it. So uh, I, I give trees to them and uh, go and check up. Uh, they send me photos, uh, update me. It's working. So the red circles, I'm sure we can work with them. Then the yellow one are the 60 actors. We are ready to sign the contract with the new uh, owners. And then uh, together with the white dots, we have a total of 200 actors already available. So these uh, white spots it's uh, that i have contact with the owners they they yeah thanks for the advice <laughs> uh you're right the south is where you see the sea on the side here or right side down the south yeah um <clears throat> yeah so um, these owners they they are ready to work for us it's just that i it's too much work for me now so i said no wait i, I see i saw the, the their lands but i need time and the resources to keep on but as you can see the potential is huge um, next slide so what uh, this is like what all the three collaborators will do, I hope we'll do. So how we will build this team and the ecosystem resolution camps, we know like it's management of volunteers, fluxes, supporting fundraising, international networking courses and opportunities, knowledge, knowledge exchange with this fireside chat and also the group WhatsApp group we have, storytelling and communication and monitoring evaluation. Rocha Villa will be like more active on the territory, organizing of courses and planting trees and research of new lands and plant design. And then plan for the planet will be like more uh, like uh, legally involved, um, also research of fundings and help with the planning of the, of the lands and try to reach the institutions that ignored us until now. Yeah, next slide. If there is a next slide, I don't remember. Uh, I guess this is the end. Ah, yeah, so this is the work we are doing. Uh, until now, it was all volunteer work. I hope that uh, we can make a step forward. It means that at least uh, one or two or three people from the uh, NGO can be can get a, a proper salary, and then we can actually the the main idea at the beginning was to buy a land, a big land where we could do everything there, like a tree nursery, research, planting trees, and everything. But then, in time, I realized that. Um, we have already a network of contacts and why not doing like one actor there two actors there three actors there instead of like being uh, like obsessed by this having one land if it happens then it will be nice also to have one pole but it's nice that we have these dislocated areas and that's it i hope i didn't uh, it was not boring it was not boring for me and uh, thanks for every uh, thanks for your listening thank you piero that was uh, not boring at all Great presentation very interesting amazing work and i think i saw a few questions in the chat already for you um i'm just moving yeah, thanks, Kat, for reposting this. So, Od was asking, mulberry trees. Od, would you like to ask this yourself? You're here, or shall I read your question? Whatever you prefer. Well, yeah, I just, I was just commented when you talked about berries because I know what it is to, to be in a dry land. 
and wanting to eat some berries at times. And I had really good res <laughs> results with mulberry trees. Like, I, have, you, have you planted some of them? Not yet. Uh -huh. but I can. Mulberry tree, even with cuttings and in the middle of the swales in southern Spain, where it's still like, yeah, we have like six months of drought or seven. This year has been eight. So we had really good results with this, just sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. We will try next autumn. <laughs> There is another question in the chat from Maria. Who owns the land and the trees or the lake? So the uh, it's people from the NGO. So at the beginning it was my friends. Then slowly they become interested in what I what my dream was, and then they become part of the NGO. And then started saying, you know, I have this land. What can we do on it? And then um, the land when we started, where we started the experimental phase and the phase one, so the lake and the forest, it was a land of uh, uh, an old man working on his own, um, that he has never used a fertilizer in his life and he has really nice dreams in his head. So I worked for him for many months and then uh, he gave me like uh, the use of the land. So we signed a contract and uh, we we sign a contract with them and then it's normally 25 years so they cannot touch the trees but normally the lands we are replanting it's the lands that they not they don't use anymore because they're too arid um, the website it's in italian and it's like this or you have the the Rocha Viva page, camp page on the ecosystem restoration camp. Oh, no, sorry, it's not the right one. And this one. I see a lot of lots of compliments about yeah. the presentation. Yeah, it was very inspiring. Day I oh, I we can all do like. For example, everybody going to one camp and then, then another camp and then another camp. I can host you every I can host you here. Are there more questions for Piero? Yeah. Thanks, Kat. Yes, Jonathan. Hello, Peter. Thank you so much for your efforts and your courage and your intellect and your heart and your, yeah, everything. Um, I've become much more enthused in particular because of John Liu introducing me to the Common Lands Foundation and the need for collaboration on large scales to attract, you know, funding. And that's led me to be involved with um, the bioregional activation movement. We're trying to work on a bioregional scale. And so I've gone from my small 120 acre project with really less than 40 acres of land to you know, rehabilitate to dreaming into 10 million acres of an entire watershed. And I have no idea how I'm doing this, but I'm just piecing together local interested folks who have small parcels up in the higher reaches of the watershed where they have springs or they might have dry gullies that once had water and kind of dreaming into how do we, we all collaborate bioregionally and what you said inspired me in that we can have small parcels we don't have to have one big collective ownership but they can be held in the commons they can be held privately they can be federal or governmental or yeah. NGOs holding the land but that we could have a bioregional plan that we're all receiving support financially from. And I'm wondering if you're at all involved in a bioregional movement or if you're familiar with the 
bioregional activation groups. Um, mm -hmm. I can get you in touch with them if you're interested. I think it's, uh, it's great what you said, especially when you think of like imagining, for example, I work with two actors here, three actors there, even if they're not too, like connected, no? And then you have these old people around seeing these young people coming in like, we have this Opido Lucano land, it's like uh, 8,000 people living the, in this town. And then imagine they, know, they all know each other and they see a movement of young, young people going to the land, working on the land. And they're like, what? And then imagine in five years time, when all these trees come up, they are full trees, fruit trees, and then we go and produce so the old people, they, they start thinking, you know, I'm old. I don't have any nephew that want to work with me. Why not joining this movement? At least my land is, and we don't have to have the obsession to buy the land, to own the land, because it's too much work and you need a lot of resources. You just need a really detailed contract in which you, you specify, of course, there will be obstacles and problems, but it's natural to have them obstacles. It's, I mean, it's part of the game. But it, imagine if more and more lands, they see the work and they're like, wow, why do they have water and I don't have water? Why when it rains, it rains on their trees and it doesn't rain on my land? Then slowly people change their ideas. And then together with these, you organize courses that they, they can participate. And then yeah, oh, I think people are curious when they see a change. They are curious, and then you can get them to. And then, the, the last thing you asked me, it's like I'm getting in touch with lots of Italian big national uh, foundations like uh, IMF. They work with the uh, forest medicine, or um, uh, like the Union of uh, for Agroforestry of Italy. I'm getting in touch with them because they. Together with Plan for the Planet Italy, we are trying to make big collaboration with with these uh, big entities because I think if we have a huge um, project all together, then we can really strike into the institutions. And it's it's happening, but it's really slow. I think it's easier also to intervene in small towns because even Matera, it's like World Heritage. Uh, capital of Europe, and even if it's like 50,000 inhabitants, not that big, but still it's really difficult to get into the institution. So what we do is we go to really small towns around Matera, and there it's easy to get to the government, really easy, because they all know each other. So if you know someone from there, ah, oh, it's my uncle, and then you can, you can work all together. I think it's becoming bigger and bigger. I need to be patient, and I think it's coming. Everything will will be done. But for this bio region, bio, it's like I also have this idea that the more lands we can um, restore, then you can have like a, a a green belt of the south of Italy because it's becoming really deserted and arid, and then you have a bio area, protected area. But for that, we need the, the involvement of big entities and institutions with which we're, we're trying to make contact with. I see Ode and Peter. I think Ode was first. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I can turn on my camera. Um, yeah, I, ju I just wanted to comment on that because that's something I'm really involved in and working on lately for Southern Europe, how to activate the water movement and these uh, bioregional regions we were talking about. And um, I'm assisting a lot John lately, the last months, and we've been also in touch uh, with Rajendra Singh, which is now moving a worldwide movement on that. And it's been approved on the last COP27. And so the idea is, is actually to help develop and support uh, those bioregional groups to thrive. So one, one thing that, that, that could be done is also to connect with this uh, on the European Commission also, there's a lot of things moving. And now I've just read that article around that today that um, 
they've been um, approving that every country within Europe should work deeper on that. So by overlapping all these different missions and getting all the information together, I really think that we can reach good, good impact. And, and a way that we are thinking about doing this too is like activating festivals, bringing people all together so to activate the local communities because of course that's that's the important point no and so we could also spread the information on on the watershed um management and and how and what many other things around that i work really closely too with the tamara ecology team for some years and so we are also gathering and bringing ideas together so i'm i'm really happy to to just uh, be at service and meet with you any other time and with John and we can maybe think more deeply around that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We can contact, I will contact you later. Okay. Thanks. Yes, thanks Aud. Peter? Yeah, uh, further on the same subject actually on how, how, how do you get uh, regions to change and I think what we saw in your presentation Presentation, Piero, is uh, you just got started. Uh, you asked one person if you could have the space to do this in, and you were given that opportunity. We see the same happening in the Altiplano, where, uh, of course, many institutions were already working at a at the large scale and trying to get everyone on board at the same time. Uh, that uh, once things got started locally, uh, more more people started to move into that direction. And you, in degraded lands, I think you're often dealing with quite conservative forces. You keep what you have uh, because there, it's so little now, uh, and I think you're dealing with the same problem in Italy. Um, and I'm curious. I mean, Terrell's in the call, and he's trying to do it in France, starting small, but reaching out to others in the area. If somewhere that by a regional concept, uh, where many of these smaller initiatives start to come together, and someone connects to the the governing higher levels. If that if that's going to work uh, very fast, we uh, Christina, who is Italian but she lives in Jordan, uh, knows that in Jordan there is quite a few initiatives, and now there's slowly growing interest on the national level to see if that can be taken to that national level, and that more resources can be put into uh, changing the way uh, Jordanians interact with the natural environment, as you are slowly starting to show in Italy that if you do make that change. There will be benefits. So uh, I I think you know it, at ERC we have this spiral model. It's it starts with individuals who are uh, courageous enough to get started. They inspire their neighbors, and slowly this movement builds to where um, hopefully national governments or regional governments start to become involved, and this can go to a regional scale. And uh, you know some of the common land projects have camps in them because somewhere the start needs to take place and then uh, that example can help the the rest of the project become more successful so that I'm, I'm really curious how this develops and jonathan if, if if this is starting to work i think that will be an incredible lesson to share with the other uh, with the other camps around the world because they're all sort of in the same position uh, starting and now wanting to scale up and most of it do it through inspiration and they're running into the same problem as you moment there's more than five neighbors interested how are you going to manage all that all that request uh, that is uh, indeed a challenge there so uh, i think this is one of the main knowledge questions we have how to how to grow in practice so let's uh, let's prioritize that one so if you learn and, and your example if we can get that written down somewhere we can start talking about it yeah i hope i won't lose all my hair that already <laughs> but uh yeah the pictures yeah. you showed you had more hair but that's uh <laughs> no but it's been it's been interesting even like the the relationship with institutions because they 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 look really interested i also like i have a lot of contacts with them but then uh then it doesn't but it's I said, like it's it's easier to start with the uh, small towns around, and also the other thing is, I really see the potential here because it's an old population here, like everybody's leaving, 
So lots of lands, lots of abandoned lands, lots of small towns with no, you can create an economy but with these projects, hosting people from, it's, it's huge. So I, I, I can see it. it's just, I have to go step by step as nature does. I cannot accelerate. This is capitalism. I need to, okay, one step at a time. I need to, and then if we, if we bring together all this huge network, like a mycorrhiza <laughs> of the roots, then we can, boom, it will. But we need to be patient. No, that's how nature does it. Mycelial networks. <laughs> Christina, I see Nick with his hand raised. Ah, I think Nick. Grazie, grazie mille, Piero. Wonderful presentation. Um, my question is if, if you can speak from the lens of rewilding, what, what are your aspirations for reintroduction of fauna? I know here in we're we're working in california we recently in the last few years have wolves back after a hundred years and we have condors coming back after a hundred years and i know italy has the both the endangered griffin and the bearded vulture and you have wolves I'm, so i'm just when i think of southern italy i think of one big olive orchard and so i'm very excited to to um, get a glimpse of what, what you're imagining. Thank you. Thanks. Um, actually, I was also telling Christina when she came, it would be nice, uh, um, yes, at the beginning to get the lens availability where we can. But then in time, as soon as we, we grow, then st start to create ales like green ales between one land and the other. So contacting all the owners of the land between or among the lands we already own and then start to create these ales for animals and fauna. This is a huge project I, I'm thinking of. And yeah, you're right. This is a huge challenge, especially here that no, no, no more vegetation. Uh, but actually we have uh, imagined that we have the only wolf here uh, adapted to eat porcupine it's the only wolf on on earth because there there were no more wild boars in that re it's a really it's like 30 minutes driving from here it's a valley and then the wolf started to eat por porcupine because we can see it from the the poo and actually where we planted all our trees Recently, they get they get videos on wolves coming back. So the more we create the ecosystem, the more we will have the uh, nature coming back. We are lucky because um, close to Matera, we have a natural reserve, and with lots of different birds, even the vulture you you were talking about. But the only thing I could do to to start this process is to plant like uh, attracting insect uh, trees at the beginning and then uh, the, all the berries for the birds. And uh, most of all is to manage water. So if you manage water in a proper way, then even the big mammals, they will come back. For example, in the, in the lake, like close to the lake, to the source, they have a, like a, a fountain. And we could see with Christina, like, uh, uh, salamanders in there. Uh, it's the black ones, really small one, and they are really rare now in the territory. So as soon as you have like a small ecosystem, nature comes back and that's what she wants. <laughs> so we just need to enhance the first steps and then the bigger thing we cannot really control. I think it's out of our human control, but you can do your part with small things at the beginning and then to connect all these lands that's what i can, can see yeah and nice. especially with all the agricultural thing as uh water one yeah he says because it's uh 
it's crazy here. Everything is um, because they get like uh, they get paid by the government to have these uh, crops, and the crops they don't even sell them. It's just a law. So they have these fields and fields and fields, kilometers. And see, it's the animals, they don't know where to go and to hide. So as soon as you have a green spot, everything is there. <laughs> because, for example, this farm we are working on is La Fiorita. There are a lot of bird watchers coming because it's the only place where you have trees. So all the birds go there. Yes, I was lucky enough to visit both Rocha Viva and Wouter's project. And yeah, I, I saw the same dynamics. As soon as you recreate even a small, tiny habitat, there's so much biodiversity and nature really comes back so quickly. And you have all the southern birds that were not seen in the area for, for decades. They're back. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, even I showed you, Christina, like there was a, when you get to the farm, there was like five meters five square meters area with soil and you have i counted them there were at least nine species of plants including two big trees so in a really really small area that's because that's because all the area around is full of the diverse species and then they they colonize even small spaces I see Antonio has a question. Would you like to ask Antonio? Yes, thank you. A uh, wonderful presentation, very inspiring. I'm actually calling from Sicily. I'm here between Trapani and Palermo. Um, we did a seed ball event about four years ago here. There was a, a there's persistent fires and we organized a little mini uh, camp to to do seed ball restoration. Uh, so we're still waiting to see those results. And now we're in the process of organizing uh, a bigger a bigger development, um, something similar where there's a an older family with a farm, their kids are in the US and we're trying to figure out how to go about doing a centropic agroforestry uh, system on their land. And I think it gets really complicated in, in terms of how to set up a business or something long term. So I'd be curious to know how you set up the Societa or what it was for um, the 25 year kind of um, uh, land land stewardship. And we can connect more on that later if we don't need to go into the details right now. Yeah, I can send you I can send you. OK. So until now we made like a simple contract with the owners we have because they're really close friends now. So I trust them. But if you want to spread from next autumn, we are preparing a good, like a, a really detailed structure document that I can share with you the experience we're having with a lot of lawyers that we know. And it's a network of people helping us to build up a document that, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, legally good and then it's good for both parts. So uh, we can share, I, yeah, I can share all the process with you if you want. Fantastic. A piacere. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Peter? Yeah, I think uh, some of us are ready for dinner, but uh, I have one, uh, maybe then the final question. I don't know what Christina's plans are with you uh, after this, but um, I, I keep I keep thinking about what Jonathan said and scaling up. And you, in your presentation, you had the little circles, the red ones you're committed to, the yellow ones you're are ready to have you be on board, and the white ones you're you're thinking about. And you sort of hinted at it. Your problem is your time and your resources. So what is your dream what can we what can we do to help you achieve the dream so that all the all the circles become red and you can be active there because i think that's what you want to do but you're you're limited by time money maybe uh access to people what is what's the big dream uh um, what is the future of racha Viva as an organization my dream is that um, we could create like a really a green belt of the south of Italy with all these lands restored with even food production and the places where people could meet up and do research on plants on fauna and how to restore lands so it would spread like um, 
like that. And yeah, actually I'm not worrying about uh, fundings and stuff. I mean, I'm searching for them. So I'm, part I'm trying to participate to fundraising and all this. But what I want to do is like to see how much I can handle every year. So, so this year, for example, with the 4,000 trees, we were able to do it, to do them in one month with no machines. So that 4,000 trees, the first year we managed them in four months with no machines. So we are improving more and more with our techniques, the work, how we work with people. For example, the first year I would invite 60 people, but then people that never had any tools in their hands. But this time I like focus, and then I reach out the people I know that they can work well, and then we go two hours and we work better. So first of all, I need time to structure my work to see how, how I can improve what I do uh, and limit the time. So this is a permaculture value you know, to maximize energy. Um, then I think the rest will come slowly because we are already participating to fundraising together with ERC. We are participating to, I'm asking for other projects, uh, help, a plan for the planet is asking all the businesses in Italy to participate. I think we can structure that, but I don't want to even risk to have like uh, a huge amount of money. And then I'm like, okay, I, I have all the resources. I have people, I have even the machines, I have the lands and everything, but it's good that we had these experimental phases, experimental phases to see how, how we can handle it. Because my dream is not to plant two hectares in one month, but to be able to plant, like I read before, Christina said, 14,000 trees in two days. That's my, that my dream. But to be able to do that, you need a lot of social organization, you need a team, a really strong team. You need time. I have uh, three jobs <laughs> and then the rest is this project. So uh, it's building up slowly. And I think you're already doing everything. Christina, she's helping me so much. So even the fact that she came here for me, it was uh, really good because it means that you care. You really care for us and we, I'm okay. I, I'm sure it will. I will. I will manage. I'm sure. And if I lose all my hair, no problem. <laughs> By the way, Peter, in Italy we eat dinner at nine. It's six thirty. Like, come on. I know, but it's uh, we're Dutch. Hey, <laughs> Walter. <laughs> we eat earlier, and then, or, or and actually, we're not eating dinner in half an hour. But that's late already for Dutch. Uh, most Dutch people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it, dark here. It's cold. Anyway, about in northern story. Italy, where I come from, also we don't eat at night. <laughs> so it depends where you are in Italy. <laughs> so just be, before the Dutch people are here, still the cooking has to start. But um, um, I want to make a brief remark. Uh, Piero made clear uh, maybe we our projects themselves doesn't have to grow big, bigger, bigst but we have to inspire and reach out to even conventional farmers to shift their agricultural practices. And uh, uh, since we are very much in the same European Union, partly for this audience, um, and this, this common agriculture policy, what in the past has been uh, having had very bad effects on the biodiversity, landscape, uh, climate. But yeah. as mentioned in Brussels, things are shifting slowly. But for the conventional farms, it can be, become very important if their uh, funding per hectare they get annually. For now, the conventional cropping system, which is monoculture cropping, which is a disaster, and it's most times not producing food for us as well as fodder or even not harvested, as Piero said, uh, it would be very useful to have our agricultural techniques based on perennial systems, on food forest systems, uh, being regarded agriculture systems and being funded the same way or even better. 
So then the farmers don't get punished to shift from a bad system to a good system. And I think uh, in the Netherlands, Netherlands, we reached this at national level fitting within some uh, uh, maneuvering uh, with the common agriculture policy. But we might start with each European uh, country being uh, in, the, in the Zoom and in our movement to search for the best practices and to put pressure uh, to get this for all uh, member states involved. So this is just some an last idea I got up after uh, yeah, the very inspirational uh, presentation, Piero, wherefore I'd like to thank you very much and keep up the good work. Thank you. I think it's something that we can, because as soon as I tried, even if I am like, um, at the beginning, I was trying a lot with the government and the institutions. But I think as soon as we get bigger as a name, even with the RC, in collaboration with the RCM plan for the planet, that especially in the south of Italy, that works. Yeah, you know south of Italy, maybe. It's like, it's really difficult because it's really corrupted and people are like, uh. but when you get names, big names, they're like, wow, what's that? So I think we, the more we grow, the more we, we have a voice. Unfortunately, it's like that, but we have to face the truth. It's like that. I see there is one question from John. Perhaps this can be the last one. Well, I, I, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that Wouter uh, van Echt was able to encourage um, Beaver to return. And so in a sense, re, um, the um, food forest is actually a kind of rewilding because it encouraged the beaver to return there. I also wanted to mention that in the last week, I've had some conversations with Carl Pretorius in South Africa. He runs Just Trees. If you haven't looked at this, you should go to Just Trees in South Africa and look at his, his uh, tree nursery. It's, I, I think it's the best tree nursery I've seen outside of China. I can say that in China, there are some larger and somewhat more effective tree nurseries, but in outside of China, this is the best tree nursery I have seen. And he has, in, in discussing with him, he suggested that it would be possible for him to host a training course or have some apprentices from the ecosystem restoration camps movement come down to South Africa for, I don't know how long it would take, a month or two months or three months to apprentice to learn the nursery techniques. But this would be so helpful for many people. And I think we, we would need to fundraise to be able to bring people who are in need of this to come down to South Africa and spend um, some time there. And he certainly has many years and decades of, of experience. So keep that in mind and let's continue to discuss this if the if the main part of the fireside chat is over and anybody is interested. Thanks.